This is how 1959's House on Haunted Hill begins. In a darkened theater, nobody in the audience for William Castle's latest foray into Schiller Theater would expect that the scares would start from moment zero. It's highly regarded as cinema's first jump scare. Watching it now, on a computer screen or a big screen TV, it doesn't hit as well. In fact, many of the scares in House on Haunted Hill have this sort of novelty to them, including the film's centerpiece, a human skeleton emerging from a vat of acid. In theaters around the country, Castle timed an actual skeleton to come down from the ceiling at this point in the film, blurring the lines between the film and reality. Castle was a genius. A mad genius, yes, but a genius. Never satisfied with solely a great horror experience, he strived for a bigger effect, like massive marketing schemes and theater effects, like the devices that would sting audience members in their seats during the tingler. And if you want a real history lesson on William Castle, you should go watch Joe Dante's Matinee. It's a really good film. For the result would be... Mant. But today, William Castle's horror films of the 50s and 60s, as well as many horror films of that era, are seen as novelties, stuff that isn't as scary as it is interesting, and films that could make up for lame effects with excellent tension. I will admit that there are some horror films from this era that still hold up. Robert Wise's The Haunting is still excellent, but many of them are mostly good for some goofs. Like, hey, look what Vincent Price is doing here, isn't that amusing? So after watching 1959's House on Haunted Hill for the first time recently, I figured, why not watch the 1999 remake? It's only 40 years apart, what could that do? As it turns out, that remake is also dated, but in an even more fascinating way. And for comparison's sakes, do you want to know what the first thing you see when that movie opens is? I bid you a humble welcome to the tale of Dark Castle Productions. The story of some good men who wanted to put a little classic horror energy into the world, but succumbed to the demons that lay within the film industry. Together, these men operated for nearly a decade and produced four films that paid tribute to the horror films that inspired them as kids. 1999's House on Haunted Hill, 2001's Thirteen Ghosts, 2002's Ghost Ship, and 2005's House of Wax. There will be food, and drink, and ghosts, and perhaps a few murders. Now, House on Haunted Hill, the original and the remake, begins with the last surviving resident of the house in question encountering a group of unconnected strangers looking for money. Life, in this case, imitates art. Terry Castle, daughter of William Castle, was approached by some filmmakers as early as 1997 with an idea to remake one of her father's features. Terry had been spending the last 20 years helping to perpetuate Castle's influence, and while films like Matinee certainly helped, it was really only the true believers at this point who thought these movies were cool. In 1997, horror was things like Scream, I Know What You Did Last Summer, and Candyman. Castle's model of entertainment was deemed archaic. Yet one very important man who grew up on Castle's films and cited Castle as a major influence on his career was Robert Zemeckis. At this point, Robert Zemeckis has not only done Romancing the Stone, Back to the Future, and Who Framed Roger Rabbit, proving he can make money, but he's done Forrest Gump and Contact, proving he can make exceptional films with state-of-the-art technology. This is the apex of Zemeckis' legendary period. By this point, he succeeded more recently and more frequently than his colleague Steven Spielberg, and he wants the world. Spielberg, by this point, had his own pet projects, and under the Amblin Entertainment property, was producing several animated series that had filled the void since the end of the golden age of the Looney Tunes. So Zemeckis felt he could have a similar extracurricular project to fund his own passion projects. Zemeckis had been talking with Joel Silver, the mega producer who had made Bruce Willis, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and Mel Gibson sure box office bets, and they were thinking of starting their own production company together that would specialize in classic-feeling horror films in the same vein as the chillers they'd grown up on. Silver had never produced a horror film before, but he was one of the main producers of Tales from the Crypt, so he knew a lot about good comic book horror. Zemeckis, however, wanted to start big. He wanted to do a remake of one of his favorite horror films of all time, William Castle's House on Haunted Hill, which is why they needed Terry Castle. She agreed, and Dark Castle Productions was born. 
The development period for this first House on Haunted Hill project lasted a good year or so, but by 1999 they had a finished script and a director in William Malone, a Tales from the Crypt director who shared Zemeckis' love for classic sci-fi and horror. Another William. Curious. It's said that, in addition to the script that Dick Beebe handed in, Malone did uncredited rewrites on most of it, and melded it into what eventually was handed to the actors. And speaking of actors, I think I should let you all in on Dark Castle's strategy for casting their films. First, you get someone with a claim. Someone who either has an Oscar or came extremely close to getting one. From here on, it gets really scary. Jeffrey Rush was only three years removed from his Best Actor award for Shine, and he was the first one cast in the Vincent Price role, which had been fittingly renamed Price. Then you get someone who's had recent success and is a cool pick for the genre. Here, Famke Jansen plays the role of Price's duplicitous wife after finding success in GoldenEye and the faculty. Then you round out the cast with hot young people like Tay Diggs, Allie Larder, Peter Gallagher, and Bridget Wilson. And then you have an oddball pick. In the original House on Haunted Hill, the role of Pritchard, the only survivor and residence of the House on Haunted Hill, is played by Alicia Cook Jr. The 1999 version went with Chris Kattan. But the thing about the oddball picks in this era of Dark Castle is that they could work. Catan just needed the right direction, the right characterization, and maybe even Joel Silver breathing down his neck telling him to shut the fuck up. Because somehow, this cast works more often than it doesn't. I think what causes House on Haunted Hill trouble is some of the younger choices, especially people like Diggs and Larder, who carry the film while a lot of the other performances are sidetracked. It does not help that a lot of Larder's character is limited to some expositional sentences, as several scenes depicting her job and how she got to the house were cut. But Rush is fantastic as the human villain of Price, now a theme park mogul rather than a regular old millionaire, and gives his all to the proceedings, even in an accent that makes him sound more like a coked-up James Woods. Sure is a funky old house, ain't it? Jansen is also really impressive as Evelyn, and elevates the character from more than just a dissatisfied 50s wife in the original. You forget how much range Jansen has in this era, and how many different types of villains she can play in just a span of a few years. I'd honestly have loved for her to be the full embodiment of the house's evil in the climax, though the film had other ideas. And Catan, miraculously, I'd say, really works as Pritchard. Though Alicia Cook's trepidation was handled well in the original, Catan has this exhausted, doomed tone of someone who's experienced all of this before, and is alarmed that no one is listening to him when it happens again. A lot of Catan's laugh lines work because they're genuine rather than a lot of his SNL material, where he's trying way too hard to get laughs. It's very odd that Catan works here, but this is a very odd film. Oh, and if you're wondering what that Universal coaster is doing in a Warner Brothers film, uh, don't think about it too much. This version of House on Haunted Hill ups the stakes on several levels. Firstly, instead of a basic old mansion, this House on Haunted Hill is an abandoned insane asylum. And basically the reason for that is William Malone wanted to make an Insane Asylum movie and Zemeckis and Silver said, sure. In some points, this is an all right translation of ideas, but it feels like the idea of the ghosts of an Insane Asylum lashing out at the descendants of the people who work there is a good plot for a completely different movie. It does give this movie a nice flavor, like the scenes in the sensory deprivation tank, which is shot like a Nine Inch Nails video for some reason, and the classic Bridget Wilson scare which is really a lot of what people remember about this one. This movie uses a blend of practical effects done by legends Greg Nicotero and Dick Smith and CGI. The bottom half of this film is laced with CGI and it hasn't held up well at all, aging arguably worse than the skeleton. The eventual villain is the embodiment of the darkness inside the house combined into this black, amorphous blob that consumes the greedy souls it wants revenge on. I think this is a case where I really would have preferred a more tangible evil we see earlier on that the ghost of the Mad Doctor shifts into whoever he wants. Why couldn't he be the sole big bad here? You have Jeffrey Combs, don't waste him. It is ultimately kind of disappointing that a remake of a film that got its scares with practical effects and camera trickery has to resort to CGI shenanigans to boost its climax, and a lot of that takes away from my appreciation of the first half, which is really effective. As a remake of the original, this does a lot right, and makes a lot of very clever translations that Castle would have been very proud of. Like a lot of Dark Castle horror products, it's just not perfect. Like, it uses a Marilyn Manson needle drop prominently.
House on Haunted Hill would make $15 million in its opening weekend, and $44 million overall on a $40 million budget. Not exactly blowing the doors off the place, but a good start. So Dark Castle went ahead with a similar $40 million budget for their next remake. Thirteen Ghosts, or is it spelled here, thir 13 inch Ghosts, is a remake of Castle's 1960 3D film of the same name. Definitely similar in tone to his House on Haunted Hill, but arguably heavier on the gimmicks, with ghosts that would only appear through the 1960s era 3D technology. Dark Castle initially intended for their 13 Ghosts to be a 3D film as well, and even included glasses that helped the characters in the film see the ghosts. Ultimately, they didn't go ahead with it, as this was 2001, and 3D technology was still not great. For the choice of directing this one, Dark Castle decided on Steve Beck, who was best known at the time for being a visual arts director for Industrial Light and Magic, and working on stuff like Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, and The Abyss, before directing some commercials. The script was a patchwork of a few different writers, mainly Neil Marshall Stevens, a professional horror story editor, and Richard Dovidio, who had just written the script for Exit Wounds. However, there were some rewrites done by none other than James Gunn, who at this point was best known for his trauma work. For a few reasons, it's important he's here. Thirteen Ghosts repeats all of the casting tropes from the last Dark Castle production. Someone with a claim? Oscar winner F. Murray Abraham, who is somehow responsible for the entirety of the film's overacting. An inspired but cool pick, Tony Shalhoub, who does a pretty awesome job as the film's emotional center, and gives the exact kind of performance the film needs, barring one or two choice moments. Son of a bitch! You can also throw Embeth Davids in here. She was most well known for playing Miss Honey and Matilda by this point, and she flexes some genre muscles that would aid her further in her career. Young hot people? Shannon Elizabeth and Matthew Lillard, who both really work here. Elizabeth as the flighty but good-natured daughter of Shalhoub's character, and Lillard as the long-suffering psychic whose patience wears thinner as the film goes on. This movie proved that Lillard had a bit more range than just being the guy from Scream or SLC Punk, and would honestly be a backdoor audition for his next career move. Oddball pick? Rapper Rod Diga has a mostly comic relief role as the family nanny and surprisingly adds a lot to the film. The story here has a bit more heart to it than House on Haunted Hill, with a family mourning their matriarch's death moving into a house left to them by an eccentric uncle, only for said uncle to be a duplicitous ghost hunter, and said house to be a machine that traps and harnesses the powers of a baker's dozen ghosts, all of whom got detailed backstories and designs that only show up sparingly during the film. The production design, costume design, makeup, lighting, and practical effects are all great. And this, combined with the performances, makes for a really fun haunted house film that doesn't take itself as seriously as the prior Dark Castle production. I am sick of this nanny shit. I've had it. This was not in the job description. I quit! There is one main issue that people have with 13 Ghosts, and that is the editing. When I talked about the editing in House on Haunted Hill, that was mostly limited to certain sections of the film, including the sensory deprivation sequence. Here, it's everywhere. And all over the place. When I say 13 Ghosts is wildly edited, I don't just mean jump cuts. I mean random sped up cuts, random slowed down frames, and really odd match cutting. The intercutting is even worse, with scenes just bopping in between each other back and forth. And this can be done well. I think about how Christopher Nolan uses intercutting in his films. But here, we essentially cut off the ends of sentences in framing whole tension, and sacrifice the integrity and consistency of the ideas here. The odd quality of the intercutting also makes it more evident when choice characters, such as both of Shalhoub's characters' kids, disappear from the movie because if they were important, we'd still be cutting back to them at random points. The most perplexing moments of the film happen because of the editing. Like the bit about halfway through where we just get 30 seconds of shots of the empty halls of the house without anything happening. And then we just cut back to our heroes like nothing's different. I can understand the stylistic aspect of editing the movie like this, as well as a hindsight influence, because a lot of horror movies around this time did go with jerkier, more unsettling editing. But this isn't an especially harsh or uninviting movie. So having the editing directly contrast with that does dull its point. That said, I do think that 13 Ghosts might be the strongest of the Dark Castle efforts, and possibly the closest to William Castle's ideas. This is not a very scary movie, but it still succeeds as a haunted house chiller. Plus, unlike House on Haunted Hill, the ghosts aren't really the villains here, and don't have anything against our heroes. The real villains are human beings who try and use these ghosts for their own means and to make a quick dime. The only people who die in this movie are people who see the ghosts as a means to an end, rather than the tortured souls that they are. And also the lawyer, but honestly his comeuppance might be the best one. 
13 Ghosts isn't a sadistic or cruel movie. It seems to really understand both its heroes, its villains, and its ghosts really well. And that makes for an effective, if not entirely scary, final product. Like I said, 13 Ghosts also was made on a $40 million budget. It made $41 million over here and a little more overseas, and did not completely break even. Plus, despite the Halloween weekend release date, the diminishing returns at the box office was the result of post-9-11 cinema fatigue, meaning if it had gone for a late summer 2001 release, it could have avoided this fate. Though respect for this movie has caught on over the years, at the time of its release, Warner wrote off the movie as a failure. As a result, Dark Castle's plan of remaking solely William Castle B-movies was temporarily halted in favor of more traditional, original horror films. Dark Castle would go ahead with another reimagining of an old horror film, but Warner would slash their usual budget and allotted them only $20 million. Even if the film was bad, they could still at least ensure a profit if the trends continued, which is exactly what happened. Technically speaking, of the four films we're talking about here, only one was financially successful. Unfortunately, it's fucking Ghost Ship. If you know anything about Ghost Ship, you know it's prologue. Because what a great fucking prologue this is. Even people who don't know horror know this prologue. It's absolutely beautiful. But that is just the prologue. There is an entire movie connected to it. And it's not great. I mean it when I say that everything good about Ghost Ship is in its prologue. It has some fancy, old-timey opening credits. It feels like something out of a 60s movie. There's character development without much dialogue. It's a sweet moment permeated by something absolutely demented. And it's a killer final beat. And then the movie starts, and we're thrust into the action with a bunch of assholes on a boat. And that's the rest of our movie. Into the fucking sea. Ghost Ship is itself a rescued bit of wreckage. An old spec script that Mark Hanlon wrote in the 90s, that was more of a play on the shining at sea, with four crew members excavating an old ship full of gold, slowly succumbing to madness and greed, and being pit against one another. There's a little bit of that in the finished product, like Gabriel Burns struggling with his alcoholism. Irish alcoholic, eh? Gee, I wonder if the black guy dies first in this one. Really? <laughs> and some tense scenes where our heroes are at each other's throats. But eventually, as the script was prepped for film, it was retouched by John Pogue, who had already done scripts for U.S. Marshals and Rollerball. So, uh... <laughs> Most of the rewriting was headed up by Joel Silver, who was responding not only to the failures of the last two Dark Castle releases, but to a post-9-11 America. We are officially in the era where Joel Silver is now riding high on his success as producer of The Matrix, and he wants to keep that money train rolling. The slashing of the budget was one tried-and-true method. Now he was reconfiguring the script and making it more of a good-versus-evil battle, which audiences could get behind in 2002, with an assist by some of the supernatural stuff the production company was known for at that point. So instead of being a psychological thriller on a boat, we instead have a haunted house story on a boat, with underdeveloped characters, terrible dialogue, Occasional hard rock needle drops. And uninspired kills. And remember, this is the one that made the most profit. According to post-mortem interviews from Juliana Margulies, who was the marquee star on this movie thanks to her work on ER, she boarded the film because she'd read the John Pogue draft, or even the earlier Mark Hanlon draft, and then got to set, was handed a script, and it was the fully Joel Silverfied version with worse dialogue, a clumsier story, and more bullshit, and she just had to go with it. I get the sense from director Steve Beck that he had a similar reaction, and he just decided to go with it as well. Neither Margulies nor Beck would ever headline a major motion picture again. Watching this film, you can see a lot of these guys just going through the motions. Margulies and Byrne especially, both of them are better than this, and Margulies has so many moments where she's trying so hard to care, but she can't be bothered to act accordingly. Remember, by this point, her ER co-star George Clooney was already directing his passion projects. Margulies was still doing things like this. She's thankfully not the only person here cursed to a life of doctor shows, though for some reason I have less sympathy for Isaiah Washington. And that honestly funnels into the main issue with Ghost Ship for me, which is that not all of the performances are on the same page here. The last few at least had one outlier, like F. Mary Abraham. Here, Byrne and Margulies don't care. Washington's overdoing it, or underdoing depending on the scene. Ron Eldred and Carl Urban are trying their best, Emily Browning's actually delivering a really effective performance as one of the dead, and Desmond Harrington was miscast. Ghost Ship is essentially Event Horizon at sea. There's a well-thought-out plot about this ship collecting souls and, and being a ferry to hell, right down to a character named Ferryman selling out our characters so he can make his shipment. 
Event Horizon operates similarly, with the spaceship essentially being a portal to hell and excavating the souls of past passengers. The difference is that the villain in Event Horizon is played by Sam Neill, who does a wonderful job at being creepy, intimidating, and downright evil as the film goes on. Maybe not his most iconic horror performance, but he really sells it there. Desmond Harrington is no Sam Neill. And even before it's revealed that he's the villain, he gives such a weak performance. He's just sleepwalking through this. It's deserving of an actor to really bring it over the edge and be menacing in the last third and in the final shot. This is just some bland white guy. Hell, Carl Urban could have done this part better. That's an actor with some real meat to him. This guy just doesn't work at all for me, and his performance sinks what was honestly a pretty interesting twist to the whole thing. Like, if you're doing something with a demonic, almost satanic turncoat character, you need someone like Sam Neill or Billy Zane or even F. Murray Abraham. Harrington wilts under the pressure of this character, when he should be thriving. And this makes the third act even worse than the film was already. So much of Ghost Ship is slow, anticlimactic, and boring. You can say a lot of things about House on Haunted Hill or 13 Ghosts, but you cannot say they were boring. This movie just had a bunch of uninteresting characters, uninspired scares and ghost stuff, murky lighting and set design, so many stupid lines, and a lot of awful CGI. Ghost Ship deviated from the Dark Castle formula in order to make money, and it worked. The film made $68 million on a $20 million budget. Though honestly, Ghost Ship profited because it resembled practically any other horror movie on the market. You take out that opening and a lot of the plot with Emily Browning, and there's nothing here you can't find in any other horror movie from 2002. And this honestly spelled the beginning of the end for Dark Castle's reputation as a beacon for old-school chillers. In 2003, they'd start fast-tracking traditional horror thrillers instead of throwbacks, and it paid off. Gothica, starring Halle Berry, made them over $100 million, and essentially kept the company afloat. Oh yeah. Since this is a story about Dark Castle Productions and we're nearing its final act, I feel as though I should let you know about who was really behind this nefarious plot. Not Zemeckis, not Silver. The co-president of Dark Castle Productions, Susan Levin, who, on the set of Gothica, would meet the actor that would lead her to becoming Susan Downey. She's so amusing. After a certain point, Dark Castle stops being Joel Silver's story and starts being Susan Downey's story. Though she got her start on Silver Pictures, she was co-running Dark Castle around the time 13 Ghosts was being produced and was heading up the company through the mid-2000s, including Gothica. Once Gothica is a success, Downey runs with this new direction, and Silver, focusing more on his main production studio, essentially follows. So Downey and Silver, and for the final time Zemeckis, would start work on what would become their final horror remake. This would not be a William Castle remake, but rather a retelling of a Vincent Price horror classic. A loose retelling. With House of Wax, Dark Castle looked to revitalize an old product, rather than to fully pay homage to its tone and aesthetic. That's why this House of Wax very much resembles a lot of the other horror movies that were popular in 2005, like the Saw movies, the Hostel movies, and other slashery torture porn features. In addition, the usual casting model for Dark Castle went out the window, with no acclaim picks, maybe one cool genre pick in Jared Paladecki, an entire cast of young hot people, and an oddball pick that just kind of worked as a marketing gimmick. We've really gone from Famke Jansen and Peter Gallagher to Chad Michael Murray and Paris Hilton. Riveting. A very smart thing that Dark Castle did here, though, was enlisting Spanish music video director Jaume Collet Serra to helm this project. This would be Collet Serra's first of many studio features, and while it's a far cry from the work he's doing now, it's a great inkling of how effortless a genre film was for him. There's nothing flashy here, but he lets the atmosphere, creepiness, and darkness do the work. While the original House of Wax was very much a Vincent Price chiller feature, this one is your standard dumb teens trespassing slasher film, with our heroes coming across an abandoned town in the middle of Louisiana, built around a legendary House of Wax with lifelike and practical creations within. As is traditionally the case in these types of slashers, our heroes are angsty, horny, underdeveloped, and killed quickly. Our final two survivors are a brother and sister duo that Chad Michael Murray and Alicia Cuthbert are playing way too intimately. And the most interesting characters we have here are our villains, a pair of fucked up previously conjoined twins who murder trespassers and make them the next exhibits. Brian Van Holt plays both of them, the charismatic but deadly beau, and the misunderstood tortured artist named Vincent. In House on Haunted Hill, 
they use Vincent Price's name and likeness to portray a character trying to present a thrill ride that keeps going awry despite his best efforts to keep it in line. And in House of Wax, they give the name Vincent to someone trying to make art that the world will never see, being forced by an abusive, intimidating man in charge to keep working. At Dark Castle's entrance, Price was the tragic hero. Now, at its undoing, Vincent is the disfigured monster. Interesting. In a way, this does echo Vincent Price's performances in both original films, but it also denotes the rise and fall of this studio. Once the source material was well-dressed and flashy, now it's hideously ugly and worthy of being hidden at all costs. To that point, House of Wax is a remake that desperately wants you to forget that it's a remake. There's no true believer winks to the original, no line-for-line -line recreations. Even the naming of Vincent could have been a complete coincidence. This isn't always a deal-breaker for me, though. John Carpenter's The Thing isn't really nodding back to The Thing from Another World, and it's regarded as a masterpiece. Soderbergh's Ocean's Eleven has no trace of any Rat Pack influence, and that's called a classic by most people I talk to. So House of Wax running from Vincent Price isn't a complete death sentence. But after a few films that fully embrace their hokey, hallowed influences, it sticks out like a sore thumb. No pun intended. And yes, the horror story that Koyet Serra and Dark Castle create here is still very compelling. And there's a ton of really atmospheric work being done here that gives House of Wax a very creepy and unsettling feel. The fact that nearly all of the effects are practical, and they all look pretty damn real, also adds to the overall effect. The kills are also good fun, and yes, the Paris Hilton one is pretty iconic. But like our central waxworking characters, the studio has taken a pre-existing idea and molded right over it, making it almost completely unrecognizable from its original form. And while it looks pretty good as it is, you have to think there's a better film in here screaming to get out. Comparing House of Wax to the Dark Castle films that came before it, even including Ghost Ship, it's like night and day. Only a fraction of the looser, chillery feel is present here, with a lot of lighting, structure, and framing resembling so many other mid-2000s horror movies. Plus, making it even more different from its predecessors, there are no ghosts! No supernatural themes at play! Just a couple of guys who like killing people and making them into wax sculptures. And after all the fun we've had with ghosts here, that just doesn't sound as enjoyable. The performances aren't even that fun, even if Jared Paladecki's doing his usual thing here. There's no Tony Shalhoub or Famke Jansen trying to spin a good performance for us, just some young actor screaming and looking frightened. What sets this movie apart from the pack is the wax stuff. And that's all insanely cool and well done, especially compared to the original. But again, compare that to what we're coming from. In the three previous features, the titular House on Haunted Hill, the titular Thir 13 Een Ghosts, and the titular Ghost Ship aren't the most interesting things in the movie. There are characters, themes, and concepts that you take away from these films, not just its gimmick. Here, the House of Wax has all of the interesting ideas and elements. You take that away, you have a film about a bunch of young hot people getting themselves killed and you can get that anywhere. Honestly, the only way that House of Wax really carries on Dark Castle's legacy is with its odd hard rock needle drops. As if this couldn't be any more full circle, Marilyn Manson's on this soundtrack as well. Yet the curious thing is that after six years of hard rock scoring these films, and as the saga of Dark Castle's chiller begins to come to a close, we hear the dawn of a new generation. Emo kids. It wasn't just that sea change that led Dark Castle to say so long and good night to their chiller remakes. House of Wax, even with the advertising hook of Come See Paris Hilton Get Murdered, underperformed at the box office. Zemeckis would leave the company after this and focus on his CGI projects, and Downey and Silver would continue releasing mainstream, conventional horror movies. Many of them would underperform as well, which led to Downey using Dark Castle as a distributor for outside productions, like Guy Ritchie's Rock and Rolla, and some Canadian co-productions, one of which would be a surprise smash for the company. After the release of Orphan, Downey stepped down to eventually form a new production company with her husband. Silver, meanwhile, would keep a husk of Dark Castle with him when he moved to Universal, though the company hasn't been responsible for a major studio production in over a decade. Now it just sits there. Sometimes you hear whispers of something moving in there. Jason Blooms talked about co-producing something with Silver. This summer, there was news they were making 13 ghosts into a television series. And then, nothing. Back into the ether, like no one was ever there. Who knows if anyone's still alive in there? Who knows if anyone wishes to find out? But if there is still life in Dark Castle, if 
there is still any potential for great spooky throwbacks, 50s and 60s chillers, the kind William Castle would want to watch over and over again, then they'll be out there, waiting. They'll come for all of us. They're coming for me now. And then they'll come for you. <laughs>